Good afternoon, everybody, and welcome to the latest edition of EU UK Forum. Uh, if you're on this call, you probably don't need much of an introduction to Sir Ivan Rogers, who's going to uh, talk to me today about the future of uh, EU UK relations. Pretty much a year since we last had uh, this conversation, uh, uh, Ivan has worked both sides of the uh, of the divide. He was uh, uh, chef de cabinet to Leon Britton in the mid nineties. He's been Europe advisor to two British prime ministers and he's worked as a perm rep uh, until his resignation in 2017 in Brussels. So he does um, understand, I think, in a pretty multifaceted way um, how EU uh, UK relations are kind of plumbed together, which is which is, I think, going to become more and more important uh, as we go forward. Now, I've been. It was about a year ago that we had this conversation and David Frost had just negotiated his TCA um, and I asked you. Uh, you know, where you were on, on as to how the EU-UK relationship was going to develop. And you said, you know, you were short-term pessimistic, it was going to be frictional and difficult, and long-term optimistic that gravity ultimately would force the two sides together. Obviously, in that year, two things have happened. One uh, less important thing, uh, David Frost has moved on. Uh, Liz Truss is in charge of the relationship. It's probably less obviously combative than when David Frost uh, did it, even if the substance of it is still very difficult, and we'll come to that. And then, of course, um, just in the last uh, uh, six weeks, we've had the, Ukraine, the invasion of Ukraine, which has turned lots of bits of, of European policy up together, so I, uh, upside down. So I guess my first question to you is, does the war in the Ukraine make you um, more optimistic in the short term that EU-UK relations are going to uh, stabilise quicker than they otherwise would have done, and if so, why? Well, hello, Peter, and uh, hello to everybody on the call. Um, short term, yes, there's an opportunity, and there could be uh, grounds for optimism, um, uh, simply because the situation is so grave, and the circumstances so grim, and the brutality so obvious, that it has been a game changer and is obviously an enormous event and you know who knows where this goes over the coming weeks months years but i don't think there's any going back to the status quo ante not just with russia but with plenty of other things and is that an opportunity for both sides of the channel to rethink where their relationship has got to and also to recognize that some of their own disagreements and divergences are a bit second order in this new world uh if not a bit third order in this new world um you would hope so so that is a genuine reason for optimism. And there have been some good signs, you know, even on issues like, you know, the preparation work on sanctions and the kind of economic statecraft, as it were, around that, or around kind of our, our, our joint perspectives. And they are often pretty joint about the future of the multilateral trading system and what one is trying to do. I think there are outside the area of the TCA and the Northern Ireland Protocol, we'll come to all that, you know, some constructive signs where, you know, sensible, serious people, both at the political and official level, can get on with stuff and actually find themselves largely in agreement about what they're trying to do. Um, I mean, you, 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 you were involved in the 2014 sanctions, which, which yes. arguably, you know, in, in hindsight, weren't properly enforced, weren't effective enough, or we wouldn't be where we are now. I was actually in Washington at the time watching the US administration help Europe build those sanctions technically in the banking system, yeah. browbeating Angela Merkel into accepting the need for those sanctions from my memory. Um, this time, we're obviously outside the room and we've been slower, partly as I understand it. I mean, you're a former Treasury man, because actually yeah. it's been quite, it's tough building your own sanctions. Is, it, is, is your argument that actually the process of standing these sanctions up has provided a way a, a way, for, you know, to, to, to start to restabilize the relationship? Is it just the kind of doing the donkey work that, that gets us into that? Well, it could help. I mean, obviously, there's a lot of activity around the G7 circuit as well, which, you know, includes us and the key 
uh, European member states and the institutions. Um, I think the Americans, if I may say so, uh, without being too indelicate, have also played this much more cleverly in 2022 and much more systematically. Uh, is that because we're not there in the room and therefore the Americans have had to work harder with Brussels and Berlin and Paris directly and with the rest of the 27? Maybe, although I don't think it's primarily that. I just think that people like uh, Tony Blinken and Bill Burns are very class acts and Toria Newland as well. And they know their stuff and they know their European Union and their instincts maybe are a bit more uh, to deal directly with the Europeans. And they've done obviously much more in terms of cutting uh, major European players into kind of intelligence information. So I think the American game has been better than it was in the Obama administration. Yeah, I was there in 2014 and it was all pretty painful. We had endless discussions of potential sanctions regimes, uh, both after the invasion of Crimea and then after the shooting down of MH17, of course. UK was very much on the hardliner uh, end then, uh, mostly with the Baltic states, but with one or two others. I mean, I don't want to be unkind about any of us, and this is certainly not directed at French uh, and Germans as opposed to the UK. There was a lot of after you, Claude, if I can put it like that, <laughs> in 2014, where we didn't really trust where the Germans were on energy security and energy supply and Nord Stream. And uh, let's be honest, I think we were right on that. Uh, probably neither we nor the Germans fully trusted where the French were on arms sales and on, you know, selling various uh, weaponry, but other high end goods uh, into the Russian market and also luxury goods, which is their specialism. And neither the French nor the Germans trusted us about the financial sector, the treatment of kleptocrats, oligarchs and economic crime and the London laundromat. So there was a lot of pointing at each other. I mean, it's not that relations were poisonous, but did Europe collectively Europe and the US collectively respond in the appropriate fashion on Crimea or after MH17? No, I think we didn't. And incidentally, I don't think that's the only occasion. I mean, I was obviously involved as well in the 2013 G7 summit because I was the Sherpa uh, for that summit when the Russian was G8 summit because the Russians were still there at that point. And, you know, I flew with David Cameron to Sochi to see Putin uh, about the Syria situation as well as about the rest of the G8. Uh, the UK and the US and others were pressing very hard for the kind of essentially removal of Assad, uh, got absolutely nowhere with Putin. And Putin has, after all, propped up the Assad regime and, and uh, essentially succeeded in his goals in Syria. So if you look at this from a Russian perspective, um, I'm afraid has the policy of the West on a whole number of things over the last few years, given Putin the encouragement that he could get away with more and more, and that there would never be a systematic, sustained, long-term reaction. Um, undoubtedly, that's the case. And that's been true on energy. That's been true on the kind of money laundering kleptocracy. That's been true. They, he's always assumed that the Europeans and the Americans would never take sustained economic pain and the risk of recession in order to punish him severely enough on sanctions that, that would any, in any way give him pause for thought. Now, obviously, that's wrong. I mean, the gratifying thing, of the, let's, be, let's be optimistic, the gratifying thing of the last six weeks has been the unity and the determination of the West, the speed at which it's acted, including in the European Union, unusual speed, the complete reversal of German positions in terms of foreign policy and energy and security policy, the preparedness of the Germans and others to, to spend up and look at operational capability in the defence world. This is a different world from the one we were inhabiting, you know, when I was in Brussels. So, so I mean, uh, all of so that's different order conflict. There are different order sanctions throughout the Brexit process, and indeed in the Cameron process. You you will you you will be familiar with this. There was always a sense in the British establishment that the UK ought to be able to play into its its strategic uh, reach, its relationship with the Five Eyes and with the United States. It's the fact that it was the along with the French the only European power able to project power. Right? There was always this sort of attempt to read across. You know, Europe couldn't really do without us, even though the EU is you know, fundamentally a trading power rather than a, yeah. a strategic power. Are we now, I mean, bringing back to EU, you, you UK relations, has this conflict allowed an opportunity for the British establishment to try and play in our strategic role? We've been front and centre dishing out these end law anti-tank weapons, talking about sending yeah. anti-ship missiles. Um, does this 
does this give us that opportunity or are we over are they overreading again well, to a degree it does, because if we're serious, you know, there are only two serious defence and security players in the European time zone, and it's us and the French. And that relationship, though, has always operated on the national security side much more through bilateral relations than it has through EU institutions. And we have always been a blockage, after all, on further defence integration, whether it's on defence capability or defence procurement. We're not there now to block. Um, so is this an opportunity uh, to have a different sort of conversation which says we are integral to the defence of Central and Eastern Europe from the Baltics to the Balkans and we intend to play our role, but if we are going to play our role, then uh, you can't end up screwing us on all aspects of the economic and social relationship within the kind of technocratic structures. So do I expect the Brits to play that tune a bit more? I'm a bit surprised that Theresa May didn't play that tune more in 2017, to be honest, but she didn't. Um, you know, and I, I'm, I'm, I'm not versed in precisely why not. So I expect a bit more of that from the kind of national security side uh, of our system, if I can put it like that. Are they destined to be disappointed? Um, I think they probably are, in all honesty. I hope it doesn't go that way, because as I say, I do think there's a chance both on the defence agenda. Look, and defence, I think the first I, European... I've just been yeah. just interrupt there. Sake of argument, yeah. you're right. And we say, look, if you want us to cooperate in this macro strategic security business, you need to be less mean about Horizon Europe 2020 or whatever you know, the way in which you make your EU car battery regulation to try and cut our our manufacturers, you know, out of the next generation of electric vehicle manufacturing. You know, there are loads yeah. of ways in which, you know, Michel Barnier was really clear that we weren't going to be an assembly hub. You know, the entire TCA was constructed in this very aggressive way. Do we, what levers do we have left? I mean, you know, so, so we're going to tell, tell the commission, look, unless you're a bit more reasonable, we're going to, we're not going to give the Ukrainians the anti-tank. Well, yeah, I, I mean, you're asking the right question because is it plausible that we would make that threat and say, well, if that's the way you're going to play the defence procurement agenda or if that's the way you're going to play the energy security agenda and make it an energy union issue at 27 and cut us out, you know, screw you guys because we're not there to defend the Eastern border. Is that really credible? Um, I think defence procurement will become a very difficult issue. It will be difficult with the Americans as well. Uh, let's not kid ourselves. The Americans are as protectionist as anybody, more protectionist than anybody on defence procurement and the whole kind of buy America regime. And that's just as protectionist under Biden as it ever was under Trump. And that won't change. My fear, I suppose, as I look at the emerging agenda, some of which we saw at Versailles, and I look at the language about strategic autonomy, which personally in the area of defence, I think is a bit of a hollow uh, joke. But I mean, I want to see the European Union individually and collectively do much more on defence. And I, you know, it's not a world I want to live in, but I, I want to see a world where the Europeans are more determined about capability and are rearming and do recognise the scale of the existential threat. My concern, I suppose, is the, the, the classic sort of commission reflex, but also other member states will be to say, well, if you're not in this club, um, you know, uh, we'll have a kind of level playing field on uh, procurement within the defence world, but we'll have buy European uh, uh, prescriptions in the same way as the Americans have buy American prescriptions, some of which don't make any sense, of course, in terms of capability. But some of the instincts in several capitals will be to say, well, this is a this is a new game and the Brits have chosen to put themselves outside this club. So what's it got to do with them? I, mean, we, we I think it's a difficult one. I think a difficult one for the UK to play because... You know, we'll come back to the kind of what did we want in the TCA. I, look, the TCA is a very thin agreement. We all know it. And we're starting to see the signs in terms of real world results and the real world impact on trade flows and investment flows for the UK. But that isn't changing the government's position on what it ever wanted out of the TCA. Can you, without kind of reopening that game, because let's be clear, I'm not advocating that we rejoin the single market or rejoin the customs union. And I don't think that's viable under a Labour government, let alone a Conservative government. We'll see, uh, or we may see. Um, but can you say in the domain of energy security, in a world where there is serious risk of deglobalization and aggressive regionalization, and where the West needs to hang together for fear of hanging separately. And we're all in the game of strengthening each other's operational capability and resilience in the face of that world. Um, can you then build a different sort of relationship, you know, in defense, where after all, as I say, when I was there, you know, my instructions were nearly always to block every initiative or on defense. We didn't want any duplication of NATO. Now we're not there to block. 
our primary interest is the same as the American interest and the same as the European interest. We want to see the, Amer the Europeans step up more in terms of spending and capability. Some of that they are going to do, in my view, in ways with which the British establishment, military and uh, industrial is uncomfortable. Some of it will be Europeanized, um, uh, you see, as I, I say, in procurement. There's no way around that. And actually, the Americans will not be as allergic to the Europeans doing it that way as the British are. Is, there, is it right there's no way around that? If you think about the next generation of fighter aircraft, you know, European consortia and the UK having a role in that, you think about Galileo during the negotiation. Yeah. Do you see a world where Ukraine actually allows the Brits to be a kind of unique and special partner in European defence procurement, development, supply chains in a way that they clearly, you know, you're out the club. Sorry, lads, you know, this is classified European stuff. You're not you're not you're not invited. Is that is that a mechanism by which we we start to kind of rethink that actually well, the UK if you if you send a neighborhood if you sent a, be if you sent a very clear signal or a set of signals that you wanted a different and deeper relationship. What does this you know what are you I, I think what you're asking me is what this entails is both sides recognizing that the world doesn't quite look like the world they thought they were in in 2016 or Indeed. even in 2019. Uh, chance would be a fine thing, Peter. I would, I would very much hope that that would break out both in the British government and in the European Commission and in European capitals. I'm not sure it will. I think the Brits could say to themselves and could mount an argument that this goes to show that the European Union is going to have to integrate further and more deeply um, in ways in, you know, in energy and in defence, as they already have in fiscal policy and, and the recovery programme, in ways that we would never have felt comfortable with, we would never have had our public vote for, we would have never supported from within, but now we're without and able to take our own sovereign decisions. They recognise that we are a key strategic partner in a way that, you know, no one else is in the time zone or hemisphere or whatever, and we're comfortable with that because we have autonomy over our decision making. Could you sort of mount an argument that actually everything that is speeding up in European integration, much of which our government basically still privately hates or not that privately hates, but actually they're going to have to learn to live with it because there's nothing they can do about the European Council deciding to do more together and more systematically in ways which the UK would have been very uncomfortable with had we been the 28th member at the table. But the UK would have to advance that argument of this goes to show that Brexit was the right course, they're having to go further, they're... Uh, integrating much more deeply in multiple different domains, none of which we would have felt comfortable with. But we welcome this from the outside and we can work alongside them on defence, on energy security, because this is now an existential challenge for the Western world, blah, blah, blah. The EU would have to say or would say, well, the UK has finally worked out that the TCA, which was their own uh, volition, is basically a, a, a thin and rather crap deal. They now know they need a foreign policy and security relationship. They now know they need a kind of a readmissions agreement on uh, asylum. They now know they need a better mobility agreement, uh, but they weren't remotely interested in that at the time. They finally worked out that, you know, we are much better friends to them than the Chinese, the Russians, uh, the other members of the BRICS. You know, welcome to the world. The Brits have finally recognised that they need a much deeper and more systematic relationship. So both, you know, it's the usual point that I make, Peter, which is both sides have to represent a kind of repositioning as a victory for their view of the world, even if both are actually recognising that the world is not at all now as it looked six weeks ago, let alone six years ago. And notwithstanding the fact that it looks different, um, I still detect... A bit of Roger's pessimism. Uh, yes, I, I, right. I, you don't see that the, the you know that the defence and strategic thing becomes a Trojan horse. Um, we're going to go to questions from about twenty minutes in. So if you have questions for Ivan, please put them in the chat, and one of the team are going to curate them, and I'll get through as many of them as I can. Um, of course, what you know, we've talked about Ukraine, and that's the big difference. One thing that is exactly the same as when we spoke a year ago is uh, Northern Ireland. Yeah. And fundamentally, Boris Johnson signed a deal which left Northern Ireland in the EU single market for goods and has repudiated that deal. He cannot accept that the corollary of that is a border in the Irish Sea, a trade border in the Irish Sea. And it doesn't seem from my conversations as if the attempt by Liz Truss to have a reset has really um, got us over the line, moved us forward particularly 
uh, in that discussion. And it remains the case, as David Frost has always said, that that um, failure to get a workable implementation of that deal uh, is continues to poison the relationship. And when I talk yeah. to se senior people around Europe, they really don't see um, Ukraine unlocking the horizon Europe 2020. They don't see Ukraine um, totally unlocking agree. this issue about a mobility chapter, which even David Frost, uh, bless him, uh, now realises would have been a good thing to have. Um, in fact, on the ERG side, if you read the British papers, there's quite a lot of agitating after the uh, May 5th local elections uh, in uh, uh, in Northern Ireland, quite a lot of agitation for a, a kind of another form of Article 16, another form of tough talking. I, I, you know, I don't want to go spend the next 45 minutes going down the Northern Ireland Protocol rubber hole, which we absolutely could easily do. <laughs> but, 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 do you? Where do you see? Uh, where do you see that being resolved? Because I still don't see how you stabilise and deepen the EU UK relationship until you have something workable on Northern Ireland. Well, Fred, I agree with all that, Peter. We could probably spend 45 hours, let alone 45 minutes. Uh, 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 you're absolutely right. I've always been pessimistic about this from the moment I resigned, if not the, before the moment I resigned. Uh, let's not rehearse the history of the mistakes made in 2016-17, which led to the December 17 agreement, which led inexorably you know, to May's uh, departure, really. Um, I think that was all obvious in 2017, which is why uh, I was forecasting it and why I was saying to your European uh, friends and old colleagues, um, but she's not going to be able to get this agreement through. She hasn't got the majority in her party. She won't go bipartisan and sooner or later it will bring her down and you'll end up with somebody like Boris Johnson in office instead. Now, you're right then to say, of course, then Johnson, because he faced the need to get to a general election, which he thought he could win heavily against Jeremy Corbyn, was prepared basically to sign off on a deal, knowing full well that he intended to repudiate it. I mean, I don't want to be too unkind, but unless they were completely innocent and ignorant about what was in the text, it was very obvious what was in the text of the of the protocol that they did sign. They not only signed it, they ratified it, ran through ratification extremely fast and declared it a glorious negotiating triumph. And then 18 months later, they produce a command paper which repudiates it and says it's completely intolerable assault on UK sovereignty. So it's not surprising that the other side thinks, OK, so you were in bad faith throughout then. So you signed off on something knowing full well that you hadn't the slightest intention of implementing it. Why should we deal with you? So we can rehearse the history ad nauseum. The question is, from here, what on earth can you do? I'm not very optimistic in what I hear, and I'm probably hearing very similar to what you're hearing by the sound of it, or from either end. I think, obviously, I think the tone has warmed a bit from when David Frost was there, but I don't think the substance is fundamentally different. Uh, I think the UK still wants a fundamental rethink and essentially a kind of rewrite of the protocol, however framed that is, whether that involves a formal change in the Commission's negotiating mandate or just a recognition that certain things the EU want are absolutely unacceptable in political terms for the unionist side in Northern Ireland. And the EU is still hung up on the idea that, you know, we can make various technocratic technical fiddles to alleviate the burdens but fundamentally, this has ended up with Northern Ireland business having the best of both worlds and access to both single markets. So what's the bloody problem? Um, so, you know, we can all kind of summarise. I think these two sides are still talking past each other heavily. It's not to say there aren't very good officials on both sides trying their best to find any sort of common ground. Maybe there was a quick moment when Liz Truss arrived where something could have happened, although personally I doubt it. I don't think her political incentives as well are point to doing a deal which might be shot down in flames. I mean, do you have, so I, I mean, do you have a solution? Line, Peter, why am I pessimistic about... I do think there's a major opportunity now, given the state of disarray in the world and the Russia-Ukraine problem, to rethink, you know, the, the fundamental nature of our alliance and then build a better relationship on that. Why do I think that probably that opportunity is still probably going to be missed? Because I think what the UK will do, I can't tell you whether they'll trigger Article 16. They've obviously uh, conducted a whole lot of work with external lawyers uh, to see whether they could get better and more congenial advice than they got from internal lawyers. Uh, who knows whether Suella Braverman or David Frost managed that. Whether or not they eventually trigger Article 16, I don't know. My instinct is that they will do a repeat of the Internal Market Bill uh, 2020. In other words you'll get legislative action in the Queen's speech, which effectively enables them to override 
uh, or ignore certain elements of the protocol they don't like and implement their own version of the protocol. If they go down that route, obviously I'm conjecturing, but I'm sort of putting two and two together and I hope I'm making five, but I think I'm making four. If they do that, I think that's going to be dynamite in European capitals. And then this idea that everybody will fall over themselves and say, well, we must find a way through and must find uh, avenues to bring the Brits in on Horizon and Lugano. And I, I just I just don't see it. I, would, I, would, I mean, I guess the difficult question to ask you is if you were if you were still in post now in Brussels, what would you be suggesting? Because the difficulty is. Um, on the one hand, the European Union, I think, the Commission, DG Sante, whatever, they they just don't really understand the political sensitivities around Northern Ireland. They say that they yeah. do, but I think emotionally they don't. But on the other hand, um, you know, when you look at, and it's going to get more complicated, you look at titanium dioxide, the food whitener, you know, where, uh, you know, as you get this passive divergence, as the EU moves on, it yeah, changes exactly. its food standards, it changes its regulatory standards, the border yeah. gets thicker and thicker because... The deal exactly. that they did is allied to such a skinny TCA. So yeah. given that constructive ambiguity, you know, if, if, if you've sat enough European councils, if there's a big row about immigration, you come up with a form of words that words allows the Hungarians to believe what they want to believe, the French to believe what they want to believe. Yeah. And we all walk away bleary eyed at five o'clock in the morning and live to fight another day because European Union is unity is more important. I don't see a constructive ambiguity solution to Northern Ireland unless I'm missing it. What what is the, you know, if Sir Ivan Rogers is God for the day, what what is the, what is the solution to Northern Ireland? Well, I'm not sure there is an optimal one that fits ever. The question is, could you make enough serious operational changes to really mitigate the things that worry, you know, significant chunks of the unionist community in some fashion, which enables them to swallow the operation of some version of the protocol and can you persuade then the more hardline europeans in the council that they're going to have to live with a version of the impl implementation of the protocol which is some way short of what you know the commission had originally promised them can you lock everybody in a room in a castle uh, for 48 hours over a weekend in may i mean you know what would i try and do but i don't think it would work and i think we've gone too far over the last five or six years for people to try it and i think both sides will worry about loss of face if they do but, you know, the time honoured solution would be to get, you know, a few of the key actors together in a closed uh, closed room, lock the door uh, and tell them to come out with answers which both sides can claim victory on, which, uh, you know, I mean, is that could that have been constructible at some point in the past? Yes, in my view, it could have been. Could we have found a different way in 2016, 17 to work together with both the Commission people and the Irish on some solution which took it as read? that neither version of a hard border was fully acceptable. So let's find an operational set of ways which enables us both to uh, solve our domestic so was the, was the How do you do that now? And is there the appetite? I mean, the big question, given what we face with the assembly elections and what's likely to happen in the assembly elections, is will we see the collapse of the institutions in Northern Ireland? And my worry is that when we get the result there and we probably get a Sinn Féin first minister and you then see the DUP and loyalist reaction to it, the government will throw uh, their own backbenchers in the ERG, but also those people are bone. And the bone, as I say, will be some domestic legislation which permits them to override certain parts of the protocol that they find offensive. Now, you know, are there ways that you could fudge the kind of European Court of Justice role, for example? Not very easy, given, you know, the solution he ultimately accepted was, as you say, basically quasi membership of the single market for Northern Ireland. And the problem here, as you rightly say, is the problem gets worse over time. So why is the Commission, but also the member states, quite hard line? Because they think this is the thin end of the wedge. And as divergence increases over time because they want a skinny a skinny Brexit and they want to take more and more advantage from divergence, then the border gets thicker. So, I mean, I'm not wildly optimistic. I, nothing I hear from either side persuades me that this is on the verge of being resolved either before the assembly elections or after. I think we're then quite likely to get what I regard as a kind of, it's not a stunt, it would obviously be a serious thing, but it would be, it would be read by the Europeans as internal market bill too. And we'll be right back into your deliberately breaking elements of um, a treaty that you negotiated allegedly in good faith with us and choosing to override that via unilateral action. And that's explosive. So if we end up there, 
then we'll be in a fairly miserable state by the summer. So my operational conclusion from that is, look, you either have to solve this in advance of the assembly elections, which now looks deeply implausible, or you have to have a real crisis summit with the key officials along as well as the key ministers. And we, they say, you know, on a Friday night, we're here until Sunday night and we're going to solve this bloody problem and both come out with forms of words which enable us at least to park this issue for the next couple of years. Yeah, but well, I, I think I, that's quite unlikely, personally. I don't want to get into who committed the original sin, but I think, you know, it's always been way too binary, the discussion. Yeah, and I exactly. completely agree that given where we are, given what happened to the internal market bill, it's really it's hard to see. Binary. And Boris Johnson's position is going to get weaker, you'd have thought, in the near term, party gate, cost of living, etc. His reflex yeah. has always been to appeal to the base that won him the premiership by doing the deal in the first place. It's hard to see how he, he repudiates it. But let I, you know, I, yeah, let's not go around that house. And my again. worry no. is that contaminates everything because I, there, there I don't think the Brits should kid themselves that just because of Russia, Ukraine, I know the British press will then be saying, you know, this is inflexible, intransigent European Union, myopic, blah, blah, blah. And, you know, don't they see the bigger picture and whatever. So you can easily ramp that up if you're him. And you can easily get yourself into a tremendous state about why this demonstrates that these ghastly narrow minded people. But. That, I'm afraid, is not going to trigger a helpful reaction on the other side no. of the channel. Very far from it. OK, so I got, we've got some questions here, which I'm going to group a couple of them together because they have they have links. Right, The first one is from John Peat, uh, who's uh, obviously the political and Brexit editor at The Economist. And he says, um, can the government persist in its strategy of pursuing security and foreign policy only really through bilateral relations uh, with France, Germany and others? Um, skating around this... Um, more politically contentious case for some stronger institutional link with the EU, which obviously when we were members, we were never keen for. Um, similar question from Adam Isaacs, who's head of unit at the European Parliament. Does Sir Ivan see any sign that the UK government will finally move on its policy of denying the EU any legitimacy as a foreign policy actor? Um, and by the way, subset question to that, should Boris have gone to the European Council? Uh, should he have been given an invite uh, when, when, when Biden was in town? Um, and I think the third question, which takes it one uh, step further on, uh, which is from Kenneth MacArthur, um, further to John and Adam's questions, do you think there is chance now for the establishment of a European Security Council, perhaps with the European G7 members, i.e. the EU, France, Germany, Italy and the UK as members? Well, it's a good set of questions. I mean, should he have gone to the European Council? Yes, and I think he wanted to, and I think Trudeau wanted to as well, uh, and the Japanese wanted to as well as Biden. Uh, so, um, and he should have been invited, but we all know the events of that weekend. Um, we all know he wasn't invited. So I think that was a pain, but not a surprise. Uh, will they uh, acknowledge the existence of the EU as a kind of strategic um, and security partner and a foreign policy actor? I, I think that's very difficult. Um, you know, so, you know, can they revisit the uh, integrated review, some of which has some good elements in it and does make passing reference to uh, European issues, but without mentioning the words EU? Look, I understand the kind of frost allergy because I obviously used to work with um, all these people over a sustained period. I understand why they didn't want to be enmeshed in the classic kind of European architecture of quasi association agreements and sort of mini summits and all that kind of stuff. I, whether I agree with it or not, there's another matter. So it didn't surprise me they took that position. I think that was obviously then regretted deeply, both on the Commission side, but on the European Parliament side and in capitals. There's always been in the Foreign Office, in my experience, and as you know, Peter, I'm not a Foreign Office man uh, by origin, but there's always been a deep uh, strand of Foreign Office thinking, which is heavily bilateral when it comes to, you know, big boy stuff, as opposed to boring regulatory uh, tradesmen's entrance uh, kind of uh, stuff. You know, there's always been that view where, you know, the serious poll mill people, you know, we deal member state to member, we, we deal state to state, we don't deal with these sort of ghastly apparatchiks in Brussels. So there's, there's always been a strong strand of, in fairness, there's been plenty of foreign office people who are not in that uh, uh, mode and who are more sophisticated than that. So I think that was always going to be difficult. I mean, you build this stuff from the bottom up. As I say, when it came to sanctions, as you, so, you yourself said, we appeared to find ourselves in a world where the only way of acting as quickly as the European Union was able to in the end was to mimic exactly the legislation which we used to have when we were in but we would got rid of when we were out 
quite ironic, really. And actually, our legislation basically specifically allows ministers to name and shame people in sanctions by dint solely of the fact that they're named in other people's sanctions. I mean, quite curious when you think about taking back control. But my more positive point on that is when you want, had to do a deal and you had to get quickly on it and you had to be in line with the Europeans and the Americans, there were quite good links and quite good operational links, both at the political level and at the senior official level, which worked. So I think my main message to many Europeans, however much they're depressed about this, is look, when stuff gets serious and existential, people have to get on with it and then they have to leave some of these kind of more ridiculous Frostian positions at the door because actually the conversation has to be had because it's an essential national need. Now, can you build on that? The danger, of course, on that is that on all the strategic and existential conversations, it sort of works. On anything short of the strategic or existential, nothing works because the machinery doesn't work and the Brits are not really prepared to use the machinery because they think it's a trap. The instincts, I think, do remain heavily bilateral of our kind of, we can do all this business direct with Paris, uh, a, a little bit less with Berlin, with some in the kind of Balts and the Poles, uh, and we can pick and choose kind of bilateral relationships. The trouble is when your opposite numbers don't actually work in that way and don't operate in that <laughs> world and are enmeshed in machinery where they're cons consistently consulting each other all the time and elaborating policy together, then constantly saying, well, we can do this in hub and spoke fashion with people who only concert with each other in the room after they've talked with us. I mean, it doesn't really work. So, do you think, Ivan, do you think, do you think, there's a slight tangent to that, but we have also, I mean, you talk about the tradesman, tradesman's entrance, but actually we have been beating around Europe trying to do some bilateral stuff on mobility and 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 services and, and bits well, and pieces. And a lot of the services stuff will have to be done bilaterally because, as I bored myself rigid by saying, actually no FTA in the on the planet is really very advanced on services. No disrespect there to what we managed to achieve on services, which was pretty thin. But most FTAs are pretty thin on services. One of the reasons why I constantly went on about the difference between being in a single market and an FTA is an FTA doesn't get you much except sort of negative. Do you do you see your individual non European discrimination? Mistakes, do you see individual European mistakes cutting youth mobility deals with the UK? Well, sure I the think Commission would be too thrilled by that, would they? I'm not sure. I mean, it depends on very complex competence questions. There are some areas where you can only make progress bilaterally, and you'd have to do that painstakingly with capitals, and that's a huge use of Whitehall resource. There will be other areas. I do think it's interesting that when it comes, you know, we haven't even discussed the kind of Ukrainian refugee issue, but I do think it's taken them a long time to work this out in the Home Office and Foreign Office. But the reality is they've worked out that bilateral deals on readmissions agreement and asylum aren't going to work. And this is going to have to be negotiated via a, via a text agreed uh, by a European Union negotiator for the 27. And this will be an extremely difficult negotiation if it ever gets underway, because it requires a mandate, many elements of which the UK won't like. But they aren't going to make any progress, member state by member state and individual state, because those states are increasingly going to say to them, but I'm sorry, a lot of, the, a lot of these issues can only be resolved with us collectively. Is that penny starting to drop even in some of the more obtuse areas of Whitehall? Um, I think it is a bit. But, you know, the appetite then to, you know, it's clear that the UK did make an approach even before Christmas, even when David Frost was in post, though I don't think he was the person making the approach, which suggested that they were thinking in terms of the control of flows of migrants across the channel. This was well before we got to the Ukrainian question. They were thinking, well, hang on, we may need a legal agreement with the EU27 as EU27, and maybe we ought to fly a kite or two on that. It is quite amazing that they failed to do any of that during the TCA process. But I mean, you know, yeah. far be it from me. I mean, I went, I went through all this with the Home Office when we were in the European Union. Theresa May, I think, understood it and should have understood it. It's pretty extraordinary that we didn't manage to do any of this when outside. We are going to have to find a way if we want more operational collaboration on cross-channel flows. We are going to have to find you know, legal avenues which suit the 27 rather than individual countries in yeah, the, on no, the bulk of stuff it, we care about. If you sold a political narrative that the, that the problem was caused by EU membership, then then you're in trouble, aren't you? Even though yeah. the jungle pre, predated Brexit by 
by by yeah. by many years. Just just before we've got other questions, but on talking about refugees, we didn't talk about the UK's refugee offer on Ukraine, which, in the context of you know re-energizing or or, or restabilizing EU UK relations, seemed to me kind of on the meaner end of things. Um, was that a mistake? Perhaps not surprising. I just wonder whether, did we miss a trick there? Well, it's wholly unsurprising, I think. Um, it's exactly what I would have thought would happen. Uh, personally, I think the speed at which this is going operationally is pretty shameful. So the numbers of Ukrainians who've actually turned up um, in this country so far um, uh, is really incredibly low. You know, Germany is now over 300,000 Ukrainians, Italy very sizable numbers. Uh, you know, it's not just the adjacent countries who are taking very sizable numbers and, and more than 4 million people have left the country and it certainly won't stop there. I'm afraid it plays into what we used to get inside the European Union um, a lot, which is the old solidarity argument solidarity and burden sharing. Incidentally, an immensely difficult argument inside the European Union without the Brits being involved, as you know, and the boot is rather on the other foot now because the Poles, the Hungarians, the Slovaks, the Czechs were not very keen to help the Italians and the southern member states when all the flows were coming up through the Mediterranean. So this stuff is always immensely difficult because it's acute questions of national sovereignty. We were always opposed to a common asylum regime when we were within, and we didn't have a common asylum regime. I think the problem is it does look extremely ungenerous in comparison with everything that the 27 have chosen to do. And they chose to act extremely rapidly and much more rapidly on Ukraine and, and in much more unified fashion than they ever did on Syria. And then the difficulty for the Brits will come when Priti Patel then turns around and say and blames her French or German or Belgian or Netherlands opposite numbers for not doing enough on cross channel flows. You know, she is going to get some quite tasty language back about the extent to which British the British have actually shouldered any of the burden on Ukraine. So Look, I hope this turns into operational success. They've done what they've done. They were never going to go without a full visa regime. Well, then make sure it bloody works and take substantial numbers and then have a good story to tell and a narrative to produce that actually you have acted quickly and taken a very significant share of the burden. If they can't stand that up and they're unable to do that over the next six to 12 months, do I think that that will rebound back on them in the future debates, which we're still going to have about flows from Iraq and Afghanistan and Iran and Syria and the Horn of Africa? Yeah, I'm afraid it will, because people think, well, in the round, what's your collective contribution? Yeah. Now, quick answer to this one, because I'm going to go and move on to something else. And we've covered some of this ground. But Bobby McDonough, uh, former Department of Foreign Affairs in, in Dublin, makes the point, if you're right, that Boris is warming up to another unilateral disapplication of the protocol. Um, and um, I forget the, what was the selective you, following of international law. How does that read across to us demanding Russia respects international law? Well, not terribly easily, really, does it? I mean, um, you know, it, seem, it seems to be very difficult to get this message through. I mean, some of us have tried over quite some time. It's not that the two situations are, you know, remotely analogous or that our intentions are as evil. They do seem to have a blind spot about realising how their own actions and their own kind of repudiation of uh, agreements reached um, in entirely consensual fashion, which they have then ratified. And, um, you know, if you repudiate those things and it's visible that you repudiate the, those things, having originally declared them to be a great success and a great triumph, you know, it sends yeah. an interesting message about your adherence to international law. Now, they have, you know, some particular beliefs about the nature of international law and international public law and the nature of EU law. And, you know, I guess all that I'm versed in it over a very long time. I think they do often seem to have great difficulty in understanding how their actions are going to be used by the bad guys. And um, they are going to be used, I'm afraid. So, look, I profoundly hope he doesn't go down this route. And as I say, the only way to avoid that is to have, um, you know, some serious quick and dirty breakthrough before the assembly election. Seems to me a very vanishingly small chance of that. Or we have to have some crisis moment afterward. The danger is if he kicks off the crisis moment on the protocol by basically blaming the EU's intransigence for the potential collapse of the Good Friday Agreement institutions, 
you know, if you set that off and you write your classic Sunday Telegraph article on that immediately after the local or assembly elections and you say it's all their bloody fault because they're the ones who've effectively pulled down the Good Friday Agreement. I mean, what are we expecting? It's going to be a pretty adverse response, isn't it? And it'll be a lot of briefing coming the other way saying, no, that this is deliberate British bad faith and deliberately stirring up loyalist and democratic unionist elements in order to pull down the protocol, which you never wanted in the first place. We have to stop the kind of recrimination and trading of blows in kind of media. If you're ever going to solve these things, it needs people to sit without kind of telephones and with very few staff in a room and say, is there a way through this that works for both of us? I, you know, we've got 15 minutes left and, and it's been, um, you know, I guess realistic or, or you could say, you know, pessimistic, um, most of your prognosis uh, about the chances of Ukraine, the departure of frost causing some kind of reset and pivot. Um, that then begs the question, well, if the EU is going to remain in its strategic autonomy rut and we're going to be remain in our sovereignty rut, um, where does the UK um, have upside? I mean, we saw during the spring statement, the, the OBR, the Office of Budget Responsibility, saying that there was nothing in the UK deregulatory agenda or in the global trade agenda that would change its long run forecast that, forecast that the long run hit to GDP from Brexit was 4% of, of uh, GDP and 15% fall in imports and exports. Um, yeah. where, where within that envelope, where does the UK have upside? Where does London effect have, have, have a chance against Brussels effect? Well, I think there are areas there. That's where I think my own position, as I say, is sometimes a bit misrepresented and misunderstood or deliberately misrepresented. Look, I've never believed that leaving a single market and producing a thin free trade area would have no or even small consequences on trade volumes, trade intensity, trade flows. It's perfectly blindingly obvious. So it's not surprising. The OBR is basically saying almost exactly what the Treasury said before the referendum. And, and it's not very surprising that that has happened and you're getting very significant reductions in trade flows with the, with the European continent on both goods and services. And I'm not even sure we've seen the worst of it. Blindingly obvious. Second thing I didn't believe, you know, we, we've had all this nonsense from, you know, senior ministers who ought to know better that there's really no difference between a single market and a free trade area. And there obviously is. And you've re-erected above all, non-tariff barriers to trade, which oddly enough weigh on your trade. No surprise. The second thing I've never really believed, and I don't believe now, and actually I think their version of what the world ought to look like uh, is also exploding in the light of events, is, oh, well, even if there are losses there, there'll be countervailing benefits from glorious free trade deals that we strike with fast-growing uh, distant countries across the globe. Now, not all of that is complete nonsense, but actually the, the benefits are pretty distant and they're mostly pretty small. And actually, if you look at we, these FTAs, do we now look at the world and think the future of our relationship is with the BRICS? Well, evidently not with Russia and evidently not really with China. And, you know, who relies on Brazil? And the South Africans appear not to be reliable on uh, on the on the Russian situation either and India well you know good luck if we manage to negotiate some sort of free trade agreement but they're not my idea of kind of massive free traders maybe we can get something so this idea that through India or China or Mercosur or all the others we could tot up a whole series of FTA because what's the benign interpretation of the kind of globalist uh, uh, Brexiteers, and I'm more sympathetic to the globalist ones than to the protectionist chauvinist ones, it was we can be nimble, entrepreneurial, we can be an entrepreneur, we can be a hub, we can have different regional agreements with every different region in the world, and we can be at the centre of that kind of action. That was the thesis. Well, that world doesn't really look like the world of 2022 as opposed to the world of 2016. I didn't buy all of it in 2016, but you could at least make an argument that we could be flexible, we could be nimble, we could be mid-Atlantic, we could have different, thinner deals with everybody, and this would enable us to move faster and take advantage, you know, blah, blah, blah. So that, I, I never never really bought that argument for Brexit. And actually, I'm only repeating what Dominic Cummings has said, you know, uh, you know, endlessly in several of his blogs about the inanity of it. Where there is a case, or at least where you could work on a case, if you're looking at the UK's very poor productivity performance over a very sustained period now, 
you do need to look at you know structural reform and supply side reform and all the old things on which they've done remarkably little it seems to me actually in the last six years but there is an agenda that you can pursue there is much of that to do with whether you did brexit or not not in my view but are there things that you could do you know can you regulate financial services differently and better because you're not doing it at 28 and because you're not trammeled by compromises at 28 so when you're looking and you're a big player and you're a global player and a potential rule maker not a rule taker in that world because you're still one of the big guys you know so can you do some things on you know insolvency or wholesale markets or green finance or taxonomy or things and can you do those better and faster and, and more nimbly reacting to events and to circumstances than the European Union? Yeah, I think you probably can. And are there then other areas in the new economy which have so far not been regulated at the supranational level by the Europeans or others where you, you, you may be able to be more fleet of foot, you may be able to put things in place where you can essentially be part of setting the rules as opposed to taking other people's rules Yes, I do buy. I do buy some of that. Not all of it, because I think we'll find that very difficult on things like data protection and uh, AI in practice, because the scale of our market will not make us an arbiter of the kind of global rules. But I mean, I do think there are some opportunities. And then the other opportunities are always the old ones, you know, agriculture. It's not, it's not possible to do much worse, in my view, than the common agricultural policy, although it's obviously better than it was 20 or 25 years ago but you know can we take some opportunities there could we have a different regional policy could we do things a bit differently on competition you know mergers state aids my problem with all of this peter is not being could could we ultimately as a sovereign state regulate certain areas of our own economy more appropriately to our own economy in the interests of you know financial stability and you know other things than if it were done at 28 yes obviously the problem i have with it all is i can't persuade myself that in macro terms even over a decade or a, or two decades that we're going to be better off net as a consequence because actually what we've done is what the obr is demonstrating we've done which is we've cut our trade and investment flows and we've made it we've We've created a headwind to UK productivity growth, which is a real problem for us over the next. However, we've done it. And, you know, to be clear, Peter, as I say, I don't believe we can rejoin the single market because we're not going to be a rule taker in financial services. And we're not going to change our position, I think, in either party on free movement of people with a preference for Europeans. And I don't think you can rejoin the customs union either, because I don't think any large sovereign state is going to say, I'm going to hive off my trade policy to somebody else and effectively be a taker of my trade policy and just implement stuff which other people have negotiated where I wasn't even in the room to decide the negotiating mandate. Yeah. So personally, we are where we are. We've left the single market. We've left the customs union. I do think, though, it's a council of despair to say, and therefore the only agreement is David Frost's agreement. That, that doesn't follow at all. There are loads of things that you could do which are better than the TCA, which are out there, which would require a different government and a different approach to do. Well, that, that takes us to a good, a good question, because I want to get back to optimistic Ivan. Um, yeah. Now, <laughs> so I, realize, I. I, I realise optimistic Ivan, you know, needs a longer time horizon. And there's a couple of questions here which I think point to two potential kind of macro longer term drivers of where i think as you said to me last time you know longer term strategic strategic alliance uh, means that actually you know there are drivers that would bring the eu and yeah. the uk together um it, jill rutter asked the question is the the fact that we've left open the door to bits of european integration that we would have always when you were perm rep stood in the way of so does that create new elements of european integration that a future European, sorry, UK government, Starmer's government, for sake of argument, could then buy into, i.e., you know, a UK that was more trusting and forthcoming. And then Richard Barfield asked a kind of tangentially allied question, which is, given the US general pivot to, to Asia and the Biden administration and the US foreign policy establishment actually never being in favour of Brexit and wanting the UK to have a functional and close and operational relationship with Europe, and given that actually, you know, another British government might look at the US and, and see, as I say, it pivoting to Asia and think, you know, our future really has to be at least with a foot in both camps. Do those two things give 
optimistic, Ivan, in the longer, in the medium term, optimism that there would be grounds to kind of build a better and less minimalist relationship than one we have now? Well, I think there is some cause for optimism, but I do think institutionally, I do think the effect on the EU of us departing, some of it's bad, and Alan Beatty produced his column on kind of why both sides trade policy is worse without the other, as it were, the other day, which was interesting. Um, some of it, though, I think is quite welcome. I mean, we would have blocked the recovery programme, and that's true, incidentally, of any Labour or any Conservative government I work for, and that would have been a bread in the bone Treasury position and the implications of commission borrowing on the scale that we've now got and the, basically the doubling of the own resources ceiling. I mean, you know, any government I've worked for for the last 30 years would have rejected that. And we'd have said it's only for the Eurozone. We'd have gone right through all the rigmarole that I inherited in 2011 on the Fiscal Compact Treaty. So actually, it's probably a bloody good thing we weren't there. They got on and did it. It's not, in my view, a, a, a complete Hamiltonian moment, but it's a big thing. Uh, it's the maximum of what they could do at the time. It shifted the dial in kind of German politics, and I suspect it won't be the last time they do it. And it's easier to do that stuff without us. And various Northern Lights colleagues, Northern, you know, the Hanseatic League colleagues and old friends basically said, without you there, we'd have sheltered behind you. We'd have let you do all the hard work. You'd have shot it all to pieces and we'd have sheltered by. And that's essentially the kind of dialogue. I think it's probably quite healthy for Europe that that dynamic is not there. And I'm glad they did the recovery program, even though I don't think it's enough. I think it's a major step. On defence, we'll see. I do think the Brits have got to stop fighting the last war on defence because we're not there to block it anymore. So all the stuff that we used to say uh, and vehemently and uh, mobilise other colleagues around on what they could and shouldn't do outside a NATO framework and in a European framework, we're not there to block it. Our primary interest now is the same as the American interest, which is that the Europeans get on and demonstrate that they're much more serious about rearmament and defence and that they spend a lot of money, but they spend it badly and they need to improve operational capability. The, I worry, I have on, the worry I have on all that is, look, I do think that's an, I do think that's an opportunity for us to behave a bit differently and say, look, we back you on that. We're not rehearsing the arguments of the old world. We want you to be able to uh, act collectively. Can you imagine German rearmament outside a European framework? You know, think of it from Central Eastern European perspectives. I mean, you know, we're going through the kind of Russian conflict at the moment, but it's always a bit spine chilling for people, the idea of a major German rearmament, because Germans have been Pacific and mercantile for the last three generations, but they weren't notably Pacific and mercantile before. No, I would, I would, so I would, we need a European. I, th I think there are things which then enable. Now, will Labour want to join them? You know, you know, Peter, from the old days, my conception of European integration and where it had to go, which is, you know, obviously completely failed and will probably carry on completely failing for a long time, is you need more of a Europe of different clubs where there is a baseline, but I do think the baseline has to be single market and customs union, and I don't think we're going to rejoin. But then on other areas of integration, you don't need, um, you know, all 27 to be joining it or, or whatever number it's going to be after any Balkan members join it. So I do think, as I say, will we come back to that sometime over the next 20 or 30 years? And could you imagine a different British government in different circumstances saying we want to be part of X, but we never want to be part of monetary union or common asylum policy or this, but that we do want to be part of this bit of integration and we're prepared to accept the institutional implications of that. At the moment, that seems a world off, but I don't think that's inconceivable when you get to 2040, 2050, no. because I don't think the current conception of European integration is, as it currently stands, is going to survive 20 or 30 years. It needs some reforms. And it needs some capability to have different versions of European Union membership. You know, when you ask yourself the Ukraine question, for example, is Ukraine a European Union member? Is it going to be? Is it going to accede? Do we think that Ukrainian accession must involve uh, the euro, must involve Schengen membership, must involve every element that applies to France and Germany? My conception no. of the world, which may be a losing conception of the world, is that's not necessarily an intelligent conception of broader Europe. It may be possible for Poland, Ukraine, Bulgaria, others in perpetuity to live in a different version of the world from the version of the world of Luxembourg. But that doesn't mean to say they aren't fully fledged members of a kind of European order. 
we've we, 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 there, there begins another entire hour's worth of discussion yeah, about exactly. how you bring the European going forward. And actually, it just touched on the last question, which we didn't really get to, which is that conversely, Anna Menon, uh, for the director of the UK and Changing Europe, makes the point that actually a more tightly integrated EU, EU might actually be harder for the UK to integrate with going forward, might actually lead to, uh, you know, a greater bifurcation you know, to the opposite um, contention of well, it will, we, well, it will if we go down this strategic autonomy versus sovereignty tack. I'm not a fan of strategic autonomy. I understand the the blather about open strategic autonomy, and one hears it all the time. But you wonder how open open is. You, I understand the the Macron type argument about recapturing sovereignty at the European level and strategic autonomy, but that's a very French argument for you know for many decades. The difficulty, as I say, Peter, is if that in the world of defence takes you into defence procurement and solidifies a kind of, you're not in this club because you're not in the single market. And therefore, if you're not a fully fledged member of the 27, you know, you can't be part of the equation on defence procurement and defence capability. Now, that vis-a-vis -vis the UK is obviously a mistake. Yeah. Because the UK needs to be central to European. On energy security, you need both the Norwegians and the Brits. You don't need them as members. We'll never be happy being members of an energy union where we're obliged to have certain common decision making and certain processes which tie what decisions we can make about our, our mix of energy supply. We're never going to agree that, it seems to me, under any government. But that does not mean that in energy security as we now face an existential challenge, which we do for the next several years, that there isn't reason for a deep, serious set of conversations between the EU, the Brits, the Norwegians, maybe the Algerians, maybe others. In other words, an energy union should not be simply and permanently a hermetically sealed beast at 27. You're going to have to find a different way of dealing with the Brits where the argument should be it's a win-win, you can strengthen each other's kind of operational resilience without damaging your own sovereignty or strategic autonomy. It, it, it feels, it feels uh, uh, at the moment as if we're still uh, a little way from those kind of um, I fear so. grown up win-win uh, uh, bits of... Uh, but we'll get there. I do think we'll get there over, you know, I don't know whether it's, you know, I'm afraid, Peter, I was probably too optimistic at saying 10 years at the time I resigned. I, I'm, I'm, I'm going to revise that upwards. I think you don't get to... Uh, a reasonably stable equilibrium until well into the second half of the 2020s and maybe beyond. But history didn't end with David Frost TCA agreement. No. Any more well, than on, that with us joining. on that optimistic note, Ivan, I'm going to stop you before you say anything else that, that tarnishes that tarnishes that little bit of optimism that Very may wise. take another 15 years, but we are going to get there. Um, fascinating hour. Thanks so much. Uh, um, it's always brilliant uh, to hear your thoughts on these things. Um, please tune in for the next EU UK forum. But that is all we have time for. Thanks very much, Peter. Thank you.